Hey there, welcome to the YouTube channel. I pray that this message encourages you and it helps you grow and become more like Jesus. And make sure you hit the subscribe button so you can continue to grow and learn more. Enjoy. And uh, the message is entitled Fishers and Men and Five Ways to Fish. Fishers and Men and Five Ways, ways to Fish. And just so you know, these These past two messages were very fitting with our vision here at Calvary. Uh, We believe we are called to be a disciple-making church. And so here's our disciple-making statements that we have here in our vision. It says we reach, connect, grow, empower, and go into our world to make disciples of Jesus. That is our vision and strategy to reach Delaware and our world and beyond. And we reach our world with the love of Christ. And then we want to connect them to the gospel and to the family of God. And just so you know, sometimes people have to belong before they believe. Just so you know. So uh, we're, not, we're not expecting you to believe in Jesus first before you can come here. We believe that you're welcome here. And then we pray that you will put your faith in Jesus Christ. Amen. That's... Thank God that Jesus doesn't wait for you to pass some test before he loves you Amen. and hangs out with you. Thank God for that. And, and so we want to connect the gospel by the way we live, by what we say, but we want to connect them to the family. So we need to do a good job of coming together in fellowship and bringing people into our lives. And when they do put their faith in Christ, it's the next step is to grow, to grow believers into fully devoted followers of Christ, disciples of Jesus Christ. And the the fourth one is now we want to empower these disciples, these followers, to go make disciples. Today, guess what? If you're a believer and you're a disciple in training, you are in the empowering, equipping phase of this journey right now. Today, I'm here to equip you to help you make disciples in this world. And so I want to send you out today at the end of the service by Go into our world. It's our last word that we use here for our disciple-making strategy to go into our world to make disciples, to be sent out to share this good news. Where do we get this from? What, what is our biblical foundation? Well, let's turn to Matthew 4. Matthew chapter 4, 18 through 22. This is when Jesus calls the first disciples. And I just want to give you a little context while you're turning to that. Uh, Jesus... This is not the first time Jesus would encounter these disciples. You can read, uh, theologians believe, the first chapter of John. He sees them. He says, come and see. You know, and, and Andrew says the same thing to Peter. Come and see. Come and see this guy. Now, just so you know, historically, disciples of rabbis, so students of rabbis, they would actually observe their the rabbis and pick and choose who they were going to follow. They would listen to teachers, okay, and they would go, I, I fit with his teaching, I fit with his teaching, and so they would pick from there who they were going to follow. Now, the difference with Jesus is he, w- he was much different. Jesus chose his followers. Jesus decided to choose his disciples, in other words, his students that would learn under him. And so Jesus was actually hanging out Uh, going around the Sea of Galilee, shining and and doing signs and wonders around these disciples. And eventually they would hear his teaching in the synagogue and all that. And so they were watching him too. They were both watching each other. And he's going to go now to these fishermen, and they're fishing. But what they don't realize is Jesus is fishing for them. I wonder when they realize that they just got caught in his net, you know. So here's what it says. One day as Jesus was walking along the shore of the Sea of Galilee... He saw two brothers, Simon, also called Peter, and Andrew, throwing a net into the water, for they fished for a living. Jesus called out to them, come, follow me, and I will show you how to fish for people. And they left their nets at once and followed him. A little farther up the shore, he saw two other brothers, James and John, sitting in a boat with their father, Zebedee, repairing their nets. And he called them to come too. They immediately followed him, leaving the boat and their father behind. Wow, just like that, well, they had been watching and observing Jesus for months. Jesus had been watching and fishing for them. Jesus strategically walks by them. Do you think that was an accident or on purpose? 
He positioned himself to call his first disciples, and so it was time to create his ministry team. And so this is the first call of disciples, and this is when they first decided to drop everything and leave their fishing career and join Jesus to fish for man. Now, we all know that's an analogy. We're not all fishers here, so it may not relate to us. But that's the point is, is Jesus used this analogy to get their attention and to bring them in. The Berean Study Bible version puts the scripture like this. Come follow me, Jesus said, and I will make you fishers of men. I love the, I will make you fishers of men. I call this scripture the fulfilling Christian life. Because everything about the Christian life can be wrapped up into this one verse. If you're here today and you're wondering, what is the Christian life? What, what, what are we supposed to do with our lives? What is this all about? Today is a great day to be here. Today is a great day to watch online as well. I want to help you understand the Christian life because I see the Christian life in this one verse. And the first word he says, Jesus says, is come. He invites us, an invitation to come to Jesus and to be with him. Do you know why that's beautiful and amazing? Because God left his throne. Jesus came. God in human form came in Jesus down to earth to be with us. So God came all the way down from heaven to be with us. And then he says, come be with me. Inviting the world. All people can come to be with Jesus. Anyone. Come and be with me. An invitation to do life with Jesus, to do life with the God of the universe. Do you know how amazing that is? Do you know how amazing that is for these men who were God-fearing men, but were waiting for the Messiah, and here the Messiah, the anointed Savior of the world has come, and he's saying, come be with me, hang out with me. That's what we do as disciples. We invite people to come and see, to come experience, to come discover who Jesus is, and we show him often through our lives, as Pastor said last week, and our words. Could we go out today and and tell some to come and, you know, hear, whether it's at church or in our homes or across the table for dinner, come and hear my story. The journey of the Christian life, we all have to come to this place where where we accept the invitation that Jesus gives us to come to him for salvation. We don't know whether salvation happens at the beginning or whether it can happen in the next part, but the next two words are follow me. Jesus says, come, follow me. And I put here salvation and consecration. It could be that here in this moment we believe in Jesus Christ and we start to follow him. But the word consecration means to be set apart, to be set apart for holy purposes, to be used by God, to be different from this world. How many of you know that when you follow Jesus, you have to start unfollowing other things? Jesus called people to repent, to turn away from this world, to turn away from sin, to turn away from worldly evil desires and turn towards him. And so that could be the hardest part of the journey is following Jesus. And it's a daily decision, church. It's a daily decision to deny self and to take up our cross, as the word says, as the Bible says, and follow Jesus wherever he goes whatever he wants us to do, whatever he asks us to do, this is the next step of our Christian life. We come to him and we come to believe in him, but we come to deny everything else because he is the one and only. What does he say? He says, you cannot serve two masters. You either love one and hate the other. You cannot serve both. Jesus calls us to fully, to fully devote ourselves, to have full devotion to him to have no other God, no other idol before him. That is a big ask, isn't it? But he wants us all to himself because he's our creator. And he knows the way to eternal life. And he knows that every other way, if you store up treasures on earth, it will burn away. But if you store up treasure in heaven, you will have it forever. Store your life in heaven, Jesus calls people to store their lives in heaven. Don't forget your soul. What good is it to have the whole world and yet forfeit your soul? 
When we follow Jesus, we discover that everything we gain in Christ is greater than everything we lose in this world. But it does take us to step out and trust that he's telling the truth. That's the hardest part. Follow me. And you know what? His burdens are easy, isn't it? Compared to what they were dealing with back then, he says, come all who are weary and need rest. I will give you rest. The law that they had to follow had over 300 little rules in it. And some were big, some were smaller, some were added to it. And Jesus was trying to fix that. He's saying, come with me. And here's the greatest commandment. Love God and love others as you would love yourself. All the commandments are wrapped up into those two. You can do that. I can do that. And that's what he called them to, to follow him in that life. He doesn't stop there, though, because we have salvation. We have the come and invitation we have the salvation and consecration of following Jesus. But you know what our lifelong process is? Transformation. No one in this room is perfect. I thank God that while he calls us to grow and mature, he doesn't wait for us to be perfect for us to be welcomed <laughs> into the church, into, the, into heaven. He's taking care of that part. And he, he purifies you and consecrates you and makes you holy as you believe in Jesus Christ. Romans 5 says that you are justified by faith. You are made new. You are forgiven. You are made clean by believing in Jesus Christ. And so you're in a new standing. You've been consecrated. You're made holy. But now that's not over. There's a process. Our old ways have to be transformed. Some of our old patterns have to go. And this is the part of the Christian life that's very important because it depends on the first two. Do we come to Christ daily and do we follow him daily so that he can transform us daily? Now, if I, if I decide, I, I can stunt my Christian growth, in other words, because I choose to not follow Christ. Uh, let's say, uh, I, this is not me, but if I choose not to follow Christ tomorrow and the day after that and the day after that, if I, if I choose to ignore him and not come to his presence, I'm going to stunt my growth. I'm going to stunt my transformation. He wants to transform us into the image of his son and help us become more like his son, Jesus Christ. We're not there yet, but we're on our way. Amen. This is part of the Christian life. And he tells the disciples in John 15, apart from me, you can do nothing. Who they were going to become and who they're being transformed into and what they would do for the kingdom of God, well, that all took time and it took them depending and remaining in Jesus Christ. Jesus wanted to impart in them his wisdom and his power and his presence, but they needed to show up to be transformed. They needed to stay in the vine. And we actually see that Jesus used them before they were transformed 100%. In Matthew 10, he sends them out two by two. They didn't have it all together. It would be after that they would still make mistakes. What am I trying to say? That the Christian journey you getting to the next part of reaching people, you're not going to be perfect before it starts. You're still in the transforming process. The Christian life, salvation in Christ, consecration, becoming like Christ, transforming to be more like Christ. And lastly, there's one more part of the Christian life that sometimes is ignored a little too much, and it's the fisher of men. Come, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. I use the word great commission, or you could use the heart and mission of God. The reason Jesus came, <clears throat> Pastor Kuhn said it last week, to seek and to save the lost. The reason we are saved, but the reason we're still here. Isn't it weird that once we get saved, we're not beamed up into heaven yet? Why? Because God has a purpose with your life. God is not done with your story. And God is not done using your story. He's called us 
in the Christian life to become fishers of men, to become disciple makers. And as we follow Jesus, we follow him to the mission fields of our neighborhoods, workplaces, and communities. When we truly follow Jesus, we grow in solidarity of his heart and what he sees and what breaks his heart. Whatever his passion is becomes our passion. You can't possibly follow Jesus and read about his life and not to start, not start think about what he's thinking about, what matters to him the most. The more you read about Christ, the more you follow his life, what happens is in here you start to want to be like him and do what he does. The Holy Spirit does that work. He does. My heart has grown for the mission field, for the people out there that don't know Jesus Christ. And this is what he says. Now, these are the beginning. This is the, the words of the, uh, of the beginning of Jesus' ministry were about reaching people, becoming fishers of men. What's interesting is, is now before Jesus departs from them, at the end of his, his time here in ministry on earth, he gives them the great commission. Now, I heard recently, and I don't have the exact statistic, but I heard recently that in America, Christians, I think it's about under 10% of Christians uh, are the only ones that know what the great commission is in churches. And I said, all right, not this church, okay? We're going to make sure we know what the great commission is. Okay, because if, if less than 10% of Christians know what the Great Commission is in America, that is not good. Okay, so here's the Great Commission. And it's in Matthew 28, 18 through 20, if you want to turn to your Bibles there. Matthew 28, 18 through 20. This is Jesus getting ready to leave the disciples to be with his father, to ascend up into heaven. It's one of the last things he says. He starts his ministry with reaching people, and now he's leaving his disciples with a mission, a co-mission, to join him in mission. And he's saying this. Jesus came and told his disciples, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you, and be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Now, how would he do that if he was going to be with the Father? His Holy Spirit would be there to help. He would send. When he departed, he imparted the Holy Spirit. He sent the Holy Spirit to be with us, to help us fulfill this mission. Now, you might be going, Ryan, I don't know. This was, this was God establishing the first church. You see that in the book of Acts. I'm pretty sure that this call was just on those 12 men and the women that joined them later. I'm pretty sure it was just for them and their setting. I'm pretty sure. Now, Pastor Kuhn, he said that he would take anyone out to eat last week. <laughs> if you could show him where you don't have to evangelize in the Bible as a believer. Only evangelists have to do it. That, he, he was basically saying that. And I'm pretty sure he did not take anyone out to dinner this past week. <laughs> because you can't. We are all called to shine. We are all called to fish. We are all called to make disciples. Because we all have a story. We all have one. Thank God we have one. That means Jesus did something for us. He saved us. So... He's calling us to this, and you might go, that's not my job. But here's the thing. This, was, this scripture was multiplication because it says, teach these new disciples. Now, this scripture is also a command, and it says, teach these new disciples to obey everything I have commanded you. It would eventually be that the new disciples would have to now obey this command. And then those new disciples that made new disciples would have to obey the command as well to make disciples. Do you see where I'm going? We are disciples. We may not have realized that yet, but you are a student, a follower, a disciple of Jesus Christ that has, he has equipped you to make disciples. He has sent his Holy Spirit. He is trying to transform you. Not just that you can receive salvation and keep it to yourself, but that you can go and fish for people, bringing them into the kingdom of God. He has, he's wanting all of us to do it. We can't separate this part from the Christian life. If we do, it's, you know what it is? Instead of the great commission, it's become the great omission. 
We've omitted it from our lives. We've, we all do everything of the Christian life until that last part. I can't do that. Well, I, I plan on ending this message with help to help you know how to do it. But you can because Jesus has given all authority for us to do it. He showed us the way. He empowers us through the Holy Spirit. You can do this with God's help. Uh, I personally think that the fishers of men part of the Christian life is the great adventure for Christianity. What I mean is um, I don't find Christianity boring at all. You know why? There's an adventure of reaching people. It's exciting. I have found so much purpose and meaning in my life. The fulfilling Christian life is fulfilling when you live out the full Christian life. That was hard to say. I say that three times fast. I have found so much meaning and purpose. In fact, I do not feel fulfilled in my Christian life without doing the fishers of men part. It's boring. I said it. Christianity is boring without this. I have a theory. I have a theory. Because there's been all these statistics over the years about millennials leaving the church. And I think there's a lot of good, valid points of why they've left. But I think we've made Christianity boring. I think we've shown them that Christianity is, atten is attending church every Sunday and that's it. Do you get where I'm going? Where's the mission? Where's the exciting challenges? Where's, where's, the, where's the stuff where you're trying to figure out how to lead someone to Jesus and they're an atheist? How do you do that? That's exciting to me. That's not scary. That means I got some studying to do. That means I have some praying to do. I have some inter intervention and intervening, praying to God to break through this atheist heart and help him see what's right in front of him, his own flesh and skin, how amazing his body is, and how they, he can, he, he's made by amazing God. That's exciting to me. I've talked to Christians who said they do not feel like they're, they've lost their fire. And, I, and I'll ask them, you know, well, how's your time with God? Oh, it's great. Awesome. You know, you're, te you're attending church somewhere? Yeah. Cool. What about sharing your faith with those who are lost? Yeah, I haven't been doing that, and I used to. I was like, do you think that there's a dot there? You think we can connect a dot there a little bit? Yeah. I remember I was just on fire for God, and I was so excited to share the word with people and pray with people out there at work or in my school or community. I was like, you know, I want to encourage you to go out and start sharing your faith again see what happens. Why? The equation's right there. Come, follow me, and I'll make you fishers of men. We're missing the last part of our faith if we don't. Jesus didn't say, come, follow me, and I'll make you excellent Bible readers. <laughs> Some of you have had perfect church attendance. Come, follow me, and I'll make you excellent church attenders. And I believe in church attendance. I'm a pastor. <laughs> but why, do I, why would I want you here or online? Because you may be someone who needs Jesus, so the reach part of our mission or you may need connections, so the connect part of our mission. Or you may need to grow in your faith, the grow part. Or you may need to be empowered and equipped, the empower part of our journey here as disciple makers. And then I can't wait to send you out today with the stuff you're going to learn at the end to go. That's why we come to church, right? But he didn't say, come follow me and I'll make you perfect church attenders or, or excellent prayer warriors, which are all good things. No. He says, come, follow me, and I'll make you fishers of men. That baffles me, because if you look at the disciples' life at that moment, they're like baby Christians or not even Christians yet, like believers in Christ yet. They, had, they were God-fearing believers, but they had not believed in the Messiah yet. They were still trying to figure Jesus out. Jesus saw who they were going to become. And if they were to stay with him and follow him, he could make them who they're supposed to be. You will be who you're supposed to be when you follow Jesus. Are you frustrated that you're not who you're supposed to be? Follow Jesus. Are you not feeling fulfilled in the Christian life? Do you think it's kind of 
it's dry and it's missing something, follow Jesus to the lost in your neighborhood. I bet you'll get excited again because that's where Jesus is. I want to be with Jesus wherever he goes. And I know he's with the lost and the hurting. Without fishers and men, I don't have a purpose in life. And so now I do because I have a mission in life. The question, though, is, is have we decided? Because in this scripture is a decision. They decided to leave their full-time career, these men, of being fishers of men, to be, or to be real-life fishers, to be fishers of men. Now, God is not calling all of us to full-time ministry. That is true. But he's always calling us to full-time Christianity. We can always shine our light. We can always love our neighbor as ourselves. He's calling every single one of us. When he called me, I didn't know. I, I didn't know at 12 years old when I was at youth group next door. I had no idea that this would, this, this would be my life. I just said yes. I dropped all my insecurities about my looks. I dropped all my focus on, on my crush. <laughs> I dropped everything, everything that was competing with Jesus. I dropped it and I followed Jesus. And I said to him at 12 years old, here am I, use me, just like Isaiah said. And I can't write my story. All I can do is follow Jesus and he's written it for me. He's, calling, he's, ask, he's asking you to follow him. And what it led me to was equipping you and reaching the lost. That's it. I'm here to pastor Christians, but also lead the unsaved to Christ. That's my journey here. That's my life. All because I said yes. I want to encourage you today to say yes. To say yes to following Jesus. Don't, don't try to figure out how he's going to change your life, you know, but I got this issue, this issue, I don't know this, I don't know that. Look, it's a journey. Can I get an Amen. It's a journey. You're not like Jesus overnight. Uh, it's taken me years to be where I am, and I'm not even done. God's not done with me yet. Amen. It's a journey, but he wants to use you in that journey. So make the decision today to follow Jesus. And so you're probably wondering, okay, Ryan, thank you for the theological uh, foundation of what this means, and that's all great and all, but how do I do this? How do I fish? Well, I'm glad you all asked, didn't you ask? <laughs> because I think a lot of times, and Pastor gave really good examples from his life, and I wanna go a little further in this. I, he set me up for this, so I promised you the biblical theological foundation for sharing our faith, but now I wanna give you the practical ways we can do it. So five ways to fish. Number one, you ready? It's really hard. Begin with prayer. Amen. I'm just joking. It's not hard. It's doable. Begin with prayer. Before Jesus chose his disciples, he prayed all night. Jesus prayed all the time. He prayed before he broke that bread. He prayed day and night. He prayed for the lost. When we pray, it prepares us. When we pray, it tunes our eyes and ears to see what God is up to in the community. When we pray for others, it makes us aware of other people. I um, have this awesome story I found, and I want to share it with you, by a guy, a guy named Louie. And uh, he went to his local mall, and he noticed this guy sitting on a bench. And he said he had this strange sensation that God was saying, go tell him that God loves him. So he sees a stranger, and he's feeling like he's supposed to. And of course, Louis did what all of us would do. He ignored it. I'm not doing that. He shrugged it off, kept on shopping. And when Louis came out of a store in another part of the mall a bit later, there was the same guy again. And you know what I'm talking about? You've been through this? Again, Louis felt an inner nudge. Go over there and tell him God loves him. He blew it off again. Oh, you don't do that to God. Then a third time, he said, he said he saw the same guy. And again, he got the same prompting. Finally, he said, all right, God. 
He walked up to the guy and said, I don't want you to, I don't want it to seem weird or anything, but I feel like I'm supposed to tell you that God loves you. Immediately, the stranger's eyes filled up with tears, and he said, this morning I was at the end of my rope. I told God, if, you, if you're real, show me you love me today. I don't know who you are, but you're the third random person who's told me that today. Wow. Sometimes we can think that prayer is not the pro- in the process of sharing our faith and sharing Jesus or fishing, but it's actually the beginning of it all to pray. There's power in prayer. Louis prays this, God, use me every day. Whoever I come in contact with, use me to bless them. Well, that day, that gentleman had three people tell him, and he says in the story that he's never had anyone tell him, and in one day, three people did. That tells me that God doesn't just speak to you. He speaks to other people in malls too. Well, guess what that means? That's the B. Did I tell you this is the BLESS acronym? Did I say that yet? I might have jumped ahead. BLESS. B-L-E-S-S. The second letter is listen. Now, you might think, well, wait a second. Am I supposed to say something yet? Pastor did a great job of saying, you know, we, we can't just stay quiet. We got to be, can't be secret Christians. We got to let it out. We're going to get there in a second. But listening is connecting. Because when we listen to our world and our coworkers, our neighbors, we know where to connect Jesus and where we should connect with them too. So listen. Now, here's the thing. I've been out in the community a lot. And I've been getting haircuts and all those other things. And all the people I talk to that I'm sharing my faith with, I'll get to this place. A lot of times when I get my haircut, they always go, so what do you do? I'm a pastor. Where? Calvary. Oh, I know that church. I got the big red roof. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> uh, and I'll say, so you know a little bit about me. What about you? Like, where are you with God? You know, where are you? What do, you do you know Jesus? Do you know what he's done for you? Tell me a little bit about your story. Almost every single time, people say, well, I haven't been to church in forever. I've been trying to go back. But, and I always stop them. They probably think this is so weird coming from a pastor. I always go, whoa, 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 wait a second. I didn't ask what your church attendance has been like in the past few years. I asked, you know, what's your relationship with Jesus like? See, I've been listening. And people have equated Christianity with church attendance. That's not true. Christianity is Jesus. And last time I checked, Jesus, God, was omnipresent. He's everywhere. And last time I checked, I take Jesus wherever I go. And so I'm bringing Jesus to them before they ever have to attend church. And I want them to attend church for the right reasons. Amen. Now, the second conversation I have is, is what's your worries about coming to church? You know, what's your hesitation? And a lot of times it's people working on Sundays every time I talk to them. I'm like, well, you know what? Let me encourage you to go to our YouTube channel, go to Facebook. You know, if, if you need some encouragement today, you know, watch last week's message, things like that. So we can take, we can take them anywhere. We can take Jesus anywhere. Praise God for that. Listen well, because then you'll know where to connect Jesus. Now, How do we listen? Doesn't that take time to listen? You know where I like to listen? When I'm eating. E stands for eat. Who likes to eat? Yeah. Do you know that in the book of Luke, Jesus eating with others was mentioned 10 times? Just in the book of Luke. And Jesus loved to eat with sinners. He loved to share a meal. It was like forming bonds and friendships when you eat. Did you know that we eat, on average, 21 times a week? I eat more like 42. (laughs) That's because I do something where I eat six small meals a day. But the point is, is if we eat 21 times a week, couldn't we give up just two meals to be with someone who might need our ears? Maybe at work, maybe, you know. Couldn't we do that? Yeah, we totally could. Because as we eat, we begin to hear their story, begin to share our story. And so the, the, the first S, so we have B-L-E-S, is serve. 
Jesus said, I did not come to be served, but to serve and to give my life as a ransom for many. We are called to serve. And sometimes one of the best ways of serving is serving with the lost, those who don't know Jesus with our neighbor. Sometimes we invite them to come serve with us here at church in the community events we do in other areas, inviting people to serve with us. We can do that. This, uh, this might be a little weird. I, I'm, I hope my neighbors are watching because I want them to hear God's love for them, but it's also going to be kind of weird because it's about my neighbor. I have a story. So I love you, neighbor, if you're watching. But I prayed on Tuesday We've been working on um, loving on our neighbors, getting to know them. And there's one couple that we've really been connecting with. We've been reaching and connecting. We were growing this relationship. And I prayed on Tuesday that God would give us an open door into their lives a little more. An hour and a half later, my wife texts me and says, hey, uh, our neighbors, which I won't say the names, they want us to come over and take their dog out for them next week. Now, I didn't pray for a little door open. But I'm going to take that as a sign from God that he just answered my prayer an hour and a half later. So, well, they have a pit bull, and so I like to keep my arms attached to my body. <laughs> so I decided to set up a little thing where we get to know, you know, get to know them. And I told Rachel, let's, let's do this. Let's go meet the dog so that when we open the door without them, I still have limbs. And um, he's an intimidating guy, little dog, not little, strong. And you know what? It turned into longer than 30 minutes in their home, sitting on couches talking. God answered a prayer right there. But I had to start praying. And then we listened to their needs over the past year. We've been eating. With, we had them over for dinner one night, uh, right at the end of COVID. And then we've been serving them. Now we're serving them again. And so guess what's next? The last S. I want to hear their story and share my story. Share your story. And get them to get close enough where you've earned the right for them to share theirs and you share yours. Jesus knew exactly when to do it. You know, when Nicodemus came to him in the middle of the night, Jesus downloaded the gospel to him. And that's why we get John chapter 3, specifically John 3.16. A Pharisee, a teacher who was a little concerned to go to Jesus by day because of his reputation, went by night. And that's when Jesus said, this could be my only time with him. I better download the whole gospel. And so he did. God will give you direction on when you should bless them with your story and with the story of Jesus Christ. How has Jesus changed your life? How has he blessed your life? It's all good to share it. Amen? Amen? Now, that sounds to me like doable ways to fish. And I want to encourage you with my last closing point, no pressure. Seriously, like no pressure. <laughs> and here's why. We don't do the saving. We just do the leading. The Holy Spirit does the convicting and the converting. You're not going to go to a cross and die for someone's sins. That's already been done for. Amen. We stop before we ever start. Out for many reasons. But let me tell you, if we will bless people, Jesus will use it to convert, to save. So if we do the blessing, let God do the converting. Amen? Amen. So... Before you begin, make sure you pray. Let's listen to those around us. Let's eat with them. That's my favorite. Let's uh, serve, and then let's share. Those are five ways that we can fish. So, fishers of men in this room, and if you don't feel like you are, you are. Called to it. He's calling you to it, and he can use you in so many ways. Can we pray? Would you make a decision today to not have it all together, but to follow the one who does? Wouldn't that be nice just to let go of all that pressure to have it all, have all the answers, to have all the perfection that you're never going to have here on this side of heaven? Let it go. Isn't that awesome? Take a deep breath. Whew. I don't have to have it all figured out. Jesus has it figured out. 
and he's going to use me. Decide today to be a fisher of men, to be a disciple of Jesus who go make disciples. You can do this. Jesus, I pray you would give ideas right now, that, Lord, you would give faces and names, whether to be our literal neighbors or the neighbor next to us at work or our friends in the community, our loved ones, our family members. God, I pray you would give us faces and names of people we can pray for every day. Lord, help us to follow Jesus' example of how he prayed and listened and he ate with those who are far from you, how he served and how he shared the gospel. This good news, that's just too good to keep in. And Lord, we trust you that you will equip us because this is the other part of the Christian life. This is the final part. And you've called us to the full Christian life, not just the first three. So we know that as we follow you, you will show us the way. You will make us and transform us into fishers of men. I thank you, Lord, that you were working in pastor's heart to bring out this topic. You were working in my heart to bring out this topic for a reason today. And it comes to the culmination of this moment that we decide to follow you everywhere you go, even to those who are far from you, who do not know you. And if there's anyone in this room right now that God has been tugging on your heart to believe in him today, to trust him for salvation from sin, salvation from death, and, give, and receiving eternal life and receiving forgiveness, would you make that decision today? Because he is nudging, he is pulling and tugging on your heart because he loves you. He has come from heaven to earth to save you. And you're one of those disciples too in time. This decision is pivotal for you today. If you want to make that decision today, would you just pray, repeat after me, Lord, I need you. I see my sin and my separation. Thank you for coming to me, inviting me to be with you. Thank you for the forgiveness that is found at the cross. I receive it. I believe in you as my Lord and Savior. And now I follow you all the days of my life. Amen. If you prayed that prayer today, we want to meet you. We want to talk. If you prayed it online, you can let us know online and we'll connect with you. Lord, be with us as we go our separate ways. Thank you, Lord, for this word. And Lord, thank you for what you're doing in this church, in our churches, in this community. We thank you, Lord, for our pastor, Steve Lamont, who could be with us today. Lord, just bless him and his family on vacation. Nurture them, God. Thank you for other pastors in this, in this community reaching the lost, God. What a blessing to have. We thank you for him and his family, Lord. God, be with us as we go our separate ways. In Jesus' name, amen.